He was still living at home with his mom and dad. He was about 75 pounds overweight. He had never even had a girlfriend and he was depressed. He tried everything. He tried to lose weight. He got on eHarmony.com. He'd done everything he possibly could and he just seemed like he was in a rut, downward spiral, didn't know what to do. So he went to his preacher. He said, preacher, I just can't live this life anymore like this. I'm depressed, I'm distressed, I'm overweight. Never even had a girlfriend and I'm just sad. And the preacher said, well, what do you think the problem is? And the young man said, well, you know, I really feel like if I could lose about 75 pounds, then, then I'd be good to go. That I would, I would feel better about myself and I would feel better about life and I'd be able to find the girl of my dreams. And the preacher said, well, that's easy. I can take 75 pounds off you in six months. And, you know, preachers don't lie, so he believed Preachers don't lie. And so he, he, he believed him and, and, and he said, okay, well, what do I need to do? And the preacher said, well, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, you be ready. You be in a workout outfit and you be ready to go. And a knock will come on your door at eight o'clock. So the guy got ready. He got dressed, put on the workout outfit, knock came on the door, opened the door. Wasn't the preacher was a beautiful young lady dressed in a track suit. She was gorgeous, and she looked at him, and she said, if you can catch me, you can have me. And she took off running. <laughs> and she, he took off running after her. And this went on every morning for six months, and he lost 83 pounds. <laughs> and he went to the preacher on a Sunday morning, and he said, preacher, I've lost 83 pounds, and let me tell you something. This morning, I almost caught her, but I had to get to church, so I had to quit. I was that close tomorrow morning. I'm going to catch that girl. And the preacher said, I didn't know you were doing that well. This is amazing news. Well, I'm excited for tomorrow morning then. Next morning came around. The guy was at the door like this, just ready to go. And a knock comes on the door, opens the door, and it's a different girl. Different girl altogether. Maybe mid-30s. 75 pounds overweight. He says, excuse me, can I help you? And she said, yeah, the preacher said, if I can catch you, I can have you. <laughs> so he took off running. But anyway. You know, it's kind of amazing what we can do if we're motivated, isn't it? You know, if we are motivated, if we allow ourselves to be motivated, it's pretty amazing some of the things that we can do. And, and I got to thinking about what to share with you and what to talk about this morning. And I think for the next few minutes, and it won't be that few because it's not my fault all that took so long. But anyway, um, for the next few minutes, um, I just want to maybe motivate you a little bit, give you some tools to help motivate yourself and, 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 and excite you to run the Christian race that's before us. You know, when I was, when I was in high school, and, and you can't tell this by looking at me, but when I was in high school, I ran track. And, and I was pretty fast. I mean, I wasn't Usain Bolt fast, but I was, I was pretty quick. But I got to tell you something. I don't run anymore. I don't. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, I think I probably could run. I think I could probably still be slightly fast, probably not as fast as I was when I was 17 years old. I, I think I could still run. I've even tried a few times, but I don't. I just don't run. And, and, and every time I try to run at 47 years old, it hurts. It's, amen, it's painful. And, and I actually talked to my chiropractor about it, and I said, it's just that my body's getting older. And he said, well, duh, yeah. But you could do it. You just have to learn to run differently now. And I thought about that, and this morning's sermon was kind of written with that thought in mind. Sometimes when people are young Christians, they run the Christian race with speed and with strength and with endurance and with enthusiasm. But as they get spiritually older, they gain a little weight, their spiritual bones get a little more achy, and very simply, they forget how to run. And that's what had happened to the Hebrew Christians that this book was written to. This book is literally a call to revival. This was a church that was being written to and preached to and, and, and told that, you know, you have kind of lost your zeal. 
You've lost your fervor. You've lost your ability to run. And I want to teach you how to run again. And in chapter 11 of Hebrews, he reminds them of some people who ran the race. He reminds them of some people who, who were running the race with endurance. People like Abraham, and Moses, and Enoch, and Rahab, and David. And then in chapter 12, he begins by saying, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. And run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He tells them what they need to do to run effectively. And the first thing he tells them that they need to do to run effectively is to cast off some weight. To cast off some weight. You know, when I, was, when I was a teenager, church, I was fast. I really was. I'm not making that up. I, I, I could run the 100 meters in about 11.5. Now, I know that's not Usain Bolt fast, but that's pretty quick for a white guy. And I, I, was, I was quick. I was fast. And, and if I tried to run the 100 meter dash now, my, my wife would just have to have 911 on speed dial. And, and, and a lot of the reason for that is because I've kind of put on some weight. I was a, who ain't in that? <laughs> you better watch out, Jack. But anyway, um, I know his name. You call someone Jack when you're aggravated with him. Don't you know that? What was I talking about? I put on some weight since then. When I was in high school, I weighed 125 pounds. I weigh 100 and none of your business now. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's, I've gained a little bit of weight. And, and I'm, I'm sluggish. How many of us spiritually feel the same way? And you know, you know what it boils down to? The reason that, that I weigh 100 and none of your business now instead of 125 is because I've chose to. I could lose weight if I wanted to, but in reality, I kind of choose not to. If I wanted to be fast again, I could. But here's the, here's the rub. I like to eat church, and I don't particularly like to exercise. So in other words, I'm not casting things off that I need to cast off to be able to run again. How does that apply to you and I spiritually? What are some things that we need to cast off? that are keeping us from running that Christian race. Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's stealth. Maybe it's stuff. But we can't run the Christian race if, if we've just got stuff piled and piled and piled on top of us. Trey, come here for a minute. I want you to, I, 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 I use people a lot in my preaching. It's fun. Um, Trey, what I want you to do is just jog right across here, gingerly. Just jog. Just jog. You're not a very good runner anyway, but that's okay. <laughs> now, I need three volunteers. I'm joking. I need three volunteers. Any of you guys right here? Come here. Just any three. Come on. Any three. Yeah, you know what's coming. You ready? He knows what's coming. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come right here. I want you to grab onto his leg down there. Just hug his leg. Get down there. Wrap your legs around his leg. All right? Now, what I want you to do is come over here and jump on his back. And I want you to just lean on him real hard. All right, Trey, run! All right. Hey, it got a little better when he cast off some weight. That wasn't even planned. Thanks, Trey. Appreciate that. Trey is now not going to vote for me to be a preacher here. But that's all right because the illustration is obvious, isn't it? He had no problem jogging across the stage. No problem. But when I put some weight on him, it's a little bit of a struggle. How many of us look that way to God? There was one point in our Christian walk where we were just jogging right along. And then we got a bunch of stuff. And then we got some sin. And then we just dealing with ourself. And before long, our run is almost a crawl. I believe that's why the Hebrew writer says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let me tell you something. 
those cloud of witnesses weren't perfect. Abraham had some weight, lying. Moses had some weight, temper tantrums, murder. Rahab had some weight, prostitution. David had some weight. We don't even have time to start with David. <laughs> but when it came time, when it came to that critical moment in their faith, they threw it off and they took off running. And that's what we're being called to do is to cast off some weight and to look in the right direction. We've got to look in the right direction. You know, when I was in seventh grade, I remember running, and you can go to the next click. When I was in the seventh grade, I was, I was running in, uh, in PE one day, and it was literally a tortoise and hare moment. I was fast, I was skinny, and we drew names, and I was to go up, up, to, uh, up against a kid named Troy, not that Troy, but a Troy, and, and he was a big old guy, and he was slow. And I thought to myself, this is gonna be fun. So I get up there and the teacher says, ready, set, go. And I took off running. And, and there was a movie out back then called Meatballs. And if y'all remember Rudy the Rabbit on Meatballs, he, he, he would do this when he ran. I decided I'd do that. The back of my head met the concrete. And guess what? Troy won. I had never been so embarrassed in my life. What happened? I was looking in the wrong direction. And sometimes we get so focused on the race that we lose sight of the finish. We get so focused on our strides, making sure that we're running just perfectly. We get focused on maybe the strides of others because if we focus on the strides of others, it, it kind of takes the heat off of our own strides. Amen. If, if, if we look at others and think to ourselves, well, you know, look at the way he's running. I'm better than that. Then it makes ourselves feel better. Or, or, or better yet, we, we focus on the spectators. We focus on the world around us. Instead of focusing on what God would have us to be, instead of focusing on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the cross makes you not want to sin. The cross makes you want to cast off that weight. When we remember the words of Isaiah that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and each one has turned into his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When, when, when we recognize that, as Christians, that should motivate us to want to cast off that weight. As the Hebrew writer said in verse 3 of our text this morning, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and not lose heart. You know, so often this time of year when we're watching the Olympics, we'll hear these great pieces about uh, an athlete that's been motivated by the death of a loved one. And maybe there's someone who wasn't supposed to do very well in the Olympics, but all of a sudden they're standing up there with a bronze medal or a silver medal or even a gold medal because they were motivated by their mother or their father or their grandparent who died right before the Olympic Games. We see it every year, right? We, we, we see that. Don't, this is yes, this is no. We see that, right? I just make sure you're hearing me. If they're motivated by that, how much more should we be motivated by he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, and I'm not going to try to make it sound easy. Because running the Christian race is hard. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's just be real with each other. It's hard, and we will trip, and we will fall, and we will bust our knee. That's why it requires discipline. It must require discipline. In what the Hebrew writer calls in verse 4, our striving against sin, we will experience discipline. And in verses 5 and 6, he, he, he directly quotes the proverb writer 
when he said, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose your heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those who he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts is a son. Now, any child or any teenager in this audience, if I were to ask you, is it fun when your parents discipline you? The answer would be no. And, and, and that's true. Discipline's not something that's fun. I think back to my dad. My dad was a strict disciplinarian. He was one of these, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you, fathers. And, and I always wanted to say, well, let's switch places and let me beat the tar out of you for a little while. But <laughs> never said it. But um, if he ever visits here, do not tell him that I said that. But discipline's not fun. But it's something that we have to do. Successful athletes are disciplined. They are disciplined. Tom was telling me yesterday that, that the, the, the rookie speech from Tom Landry when, when he was in Cowboys rookie camp was, if you can't play, you can't stay. And that requires discipline. It means do it. It means work hard. And that's not always fun. And sometimes when we don't discipline ourselves, church, God will do it for us. And that's not fun either. Matter of fact, it's more fun to discipline yourselves and let, instead of letting God do it. And, and you might wonder, well, how do I know if God's disciplining me? How do I know if these trials and these struggles and all this stuff that I'm going through is God's discipline? How can I know? I just say just treat it like it is. Allow every negative experience in your life to motivate you to be more disciplined and to run that race even harder. To run effectively, you must cast off weight. You must look forward. You must be disciplined. And then finally, it requires strength. You must be strong. You must strengthen yourself. Notice verses 12 and 13 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. I'll just say this as plainly as I can. I think sometimes the reason that we become spiritual wimps is we spend our time feeding ourselves on spiritual junk food. The psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 1, Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. That's our food. That is our food. Day and night, 24-7. We need to be nourishing ourselves with the Word of God. You know, I told you earlier I could be fast if I wanted to, but I have got every excuse in the book for not running. My back hurts. My knees are bad. My feet hurt. My feet are bad. You know what it really boils down to? I don't want to. Those aren't reasons. Those are excuses. You know, it seems like every year I make that New Year's resolution. I make that New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose a little weight and I'm going to start running again. And it just never happens. This year I think I'm going to make one I can keep. Eat more and get fat. You know, I, I, I can keep that one. But the point is... We can do what we want to do. Amen? Amen? If we want to do it, we can do it, and God will bless us in doing it. The text says that when we strengthen our knees and our feeble arms, it will bring healing. If you want to be spiritually strong, you can. If you want to be a spiritual wimp, you can do that too. But if you really want to run the race, then you've got to be strong. And you've got to cast off some weight. And you've got to look in the right direction. And you've got to be disciplined. And if we do that, not only will we run the Christian race, we'll win it, church. Like Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, a crown of righteousness is laid up for me. And not only me, but all those who love his appearing. You see, the Christian race has a reward. There is a finish line that we are going to cross, and that reward is in heaven. Verse 23 tells us that when we finish the Christian race, that when we continue to look to Jesus, that our name is registered in heaven. We have a reservation 
in heaven. Last year, my wife and I went to my nephew's wedding in Oklahoma City, and we flew into Dallas uh, because I'm a cheapskate. And Dallas has Spirit Airlines. Um, Spirit Airlines from Oakland to Dallas round trip was 130 bucks. What could go wrong? Hmm. Um, their, their little tagline should be, Spirit Airlines, we'll get you there when we get you there. That, that, that should be their tagline. Um, we got there at about 2.30 in the morning. And we were supposed to get there at 11.30 at night. We got there at about 2.30 in the morning. And, but it was okay. I, I had a reservation at a hotel by the airport there. I'd already prepaid for the reservation, so it was guaranteed. They'd already taken the money out of my bank account, so I had a room. I was good to go. We showed up at the, at the Super 8 Motel there in Dallas, and because I'm a cheapskate. We showed up at the Super 8 Motel there in Dallas, and they said, we overbooked. We don't have a room for you. And, and I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. And I argued and I argued and I argued. And I said, listen, listen, if the President of the United States showed up right now, would you be able to find a room for him? And she said, well, yeah, I, I, probably. And I said, well, he's not coming. Give me his room. <laughs> and that didn't work. I tried. But I tried. Can't blame a guy for trying. Well, anyway, what I did is I went out to the car. We had a reservation the next night in Oklahoma City. So I called the, the hotel in Oklahoma City and I said, listen, I have a strange question. Can I get an early check-in? And they said, well, sure. And I said, no, I, I, I mean an early check-in. And I explained what had happened and that we didn't have a room and that we were tired and that uh, I would be there in about three and a half hours. So he said, so you're wanting to check in at like seven in the morning? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, we weren't sold out last night. We've got rooms available. That's fine. Come on. I'll be waiting on you. When I got there, we pulled up. We were exhausted. We parked the car. We walked in with our bags. I must have just looked weary because I walk in and the man walks out from behind the desk and he says, here's your key. Your room's ready. Go get some sleep. And I, I just, I think about, I think about when we, when we stand before Jesus and he comes up and he, he just meets us. And he says, it's ready. I've been waiting on you. It's ready. Go get your eternal rest. Don't you look forward to that day. Don't you look forward to that day that we have a reservation church. Note to self, if take the job here, no yelling, they blow you up in the sound room. <sighs> you know what Peter says about our inheritance? He says it's incorruptible and undefiled and will not fade away. And it's reserved in heaven for us. You know what? Things on this earth go wrong. Things on this earth go wrong. In heaven, nothing will go wrong. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more microphones going, Bleh! none of that. All those things are passed away. And we have a place in heaven that is reserved for us, but that reward is contingent upon us winning and finishing the race. I love the Olympics. I watch sports during the Olympics that I never watch any other time, don't you? Winter Olympics, I watch curling. I would never watch that any other time, but I watch it during the Winter Olympics. And during Summer Olympics, of course, I love watching track. And my favorite Olympic memory is in 1992, Derek Redmond from England. Derek Redmond was uh, running the race, and he was expected to win at least a place. He had been training his whole life for this moment. And this was a moment that Derek had been looking forward to. His family was there. Everyone was there as Derek was running this race. And then all of a sudden, as he turned around the third turn, he felt something. He hit the ground. He had torn his right hamstring. But he had been waiting his whole life for this moment. And Derek just wanted to finish. So Derek got up 
And in his agony, he started limping and he started limping and he tried and he kept falling and getting up. And then all of a sudden you saw someone climb out out of the stands and run to Derek's aid. And it was his father. And his father takes Derek. And if you ever watch the video on YouTube, he, he's pushing security guards away and saying, this is my son. I'm his father. And together they cross the finish line. What a beautiful picture of our father in heaven. Because I don't know about you, church, but I keep I keep pulling things. And I keep falling down and I keep tripping. But I've got a father. I've got a father. You've got a father who is going to come to your aid and come to your side. And he is going to walk you across that finish line. And you don't have to win. You just have to finish. And he's going to help us do it. We've just got to endure. We've got to keep on going. We've got to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We've got to run the race with endurance that was set before us. We're going to sing an invitation song called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And as we sing this invitation song, I want you to try to remember that picture in your mind of Derek Redmond's father with his arms around him. And then I want you to replace Derek with you, with your tears, with your hurts, with your sorrows, with your frustrations. And I want you to replace Derek's father with your heavenly father and his arms around you just wanting to get you across the finish line. Because if you don't get anything else out of this sermon today, get this. God wants you in heaven and he's going to do everything in his power to get you there. So as we sing this song this morning, if you are in need of love from your father, he is ready to give it. He's given it through Jesus and he's ready to give it through this church. Won't you come while we stand and sing? How deep the Father's love.